Behind us, the sun is fully set as we enter the dark of night. But the big question is, is Manitoba in the dark? Manitoba running all the way up to Hudson's Bay and the community of Churchill. And in those areas, some amazing features. The largest denning site of polar bears anywhere in the world. And with the largest population of beluga whales at 25,000. Manitoba boasts over 100,000 lakes. And because of that, has some of the largest inland freshwater fish on the continent. And when the term that you've heard about Canada comes, it's a dry cold, eh? They're talking about this place with some of the driest and coldest winters. In fact, once beating the temperature on Mars and some of the hottest, driest summers, the variance in this province makes the people here resilient and tough as nails. But are they tough enough to weather the tides of change that are sweeping through all aspects of our means of transportation? Come and join me and let's go find out if this little part of the world is getting themselves totally trucked up. Good morning, trucked up guys and gals. I am in Brandon, Manitoba. The wind has died down. It's a beautiful sunny morning and I got some good news. Right across the street from where I'm staying is a Shell Recharge. I'm discovering all kinds of things on this trip. One is, it turns out that Shell's part of the Ford Blue Oval Network. The one that I thought didn't work very well, well it's working really well here because I just put it in on my phone this morning, popped up on my Ford Pass app and said, do you want a precondition and charge it this one? I said, yes. I drove up, it said activate, it already did my wallet and the rate is pretty low again, around 35 cents a kilowatt I believe. And then it's off to my morning trucked up stop and then the journey starts. We're gonna figure out what's going on in Manitoba, what isn't going on in Manitoba, but this, this is a very good start. It's a brisk morning in Brandon, currently around five degrees Celsius, or just a couple of notches above freezing. A little bit about Manitoba. A large portion of Manitoba doesn't have any highways. A large portion of Manitoba doesn't have many roads. And when I say roads, maybe I'm being a little conservative. Paved roads, well, marked roads. Also, there's this little thing called Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg takes up the entire center of the province. And there's only two major highways. I don't know if a major highway is what these roads are. One of them goes along the western side and heads up north to a place called Flin Flon. To get there in an electric vehicle has some mm, challenges. From a place called Dauphin, driving up to the pass, the route toward Flin Flon, or the route, is just shy of 400 kilometers. Both chargers are 50 kilowatt. The one in the pass says it charges at around 20 to 25 kilowatts, and there's nothing after that to get to Flin Flon. The other option is to go up the edge of the lake through central Manitoba and then dogleg east towards Hudson Bay. You can't get to Hudson Bay. Well, maybe you can, but not on any marked road. You can get to Thompson, however. The problem is between one charger and the other is about 800 kilometers. Surprisingly, there's a charger in Thompson, but there's no way to reach it. Maybe some people in Thompson want to buy EVs and they've got a local means of charging up their vehicle while they're there, but they're not getting out of Thompson. I've had a chance to spend a little time in Brandon and I've discovered there are chargers everywhere. The population of Brandon is about 50,000. It's one of the fastest growing municipalities and it's not the capital. I mean, you've got Portage La Prairie down the road, and you've got Winnipeg, but compared to what I saw in Saskatchewan, it's night and day. We are off to Dauphin, Manitoba. It's 157 kilometers north. It's the next charger out. Uh, one thing, as I mentioned before, is most of the population is all in the south of Manitoba due to its topography. You don't have any major town outside of the road that I'm gonna be going on to Dauphin and then up to the pass and then this Flin Flon. Are those reachable? We're about to find out. It's just huge efforts being made to preserve, even create wetlands. The amount of wildlife is obvious. Almost every one of these little ponds, lakes, wetlands, marshes, there's critters. I love that stuff. I'm like freaking Shrek. And you know how you like to have your cabin by the lake? Well, in Manitoba, you can get your cabin and your lake 
because there's so many times I've seen a little lake or a pond and a little cabin and that's it and there's just tons of them now I seem to be entering some kind of national park I believe riding mountain national park you know what I love about being back in the prairies magpies everyone called them pests when I was a kid I thought they were the best thing ever and they just look like this exotic crow because well they're an exotic crow and they're freaking smart they're like ravens crows whiskey jacks blue jays they're all in the same corvid family and they're all freaking little geniuses they can use tools and they remember everything they remember people they remember whether they like you or hate you oh yeah if you throw a stick at one the whole community the whole neighborhood knows that you're the dick who threw the stick there's a big ass lake over to our, our left massive but this is common like this is lakes and ponds I just love all the water features it's like they were put in oh it's a water feature you know we want to put some fountains so put some water features we covered our whole province in water features kind of a stupid thing for me to say water features Manitoba's got some really awesome places to visit now think about that Manitoba hydro I'll tell you right now I know a whole whack pile of people with lightnings who would be pulling boats up here who would be pulling their campers up here I'm telling you you would do way better with tourism because all of these crazy EV people love to go on trips you'd have model Y's and model threes they'd be the invasion of the cyber trucks because they want to come up and test all of this stuff not just demonstrate to others but the challenge is it within ourselves. It's just that feeling of adventure that you get out of it. And if you're not into that, we'll just buy a gas or diesel truck. It's okay. But if you want to go out and just not use any gas at all, just drive a cell phone and see all the crazy things you could do with it, you should buy an EV truck. And as you can see, it's not really limiting me. It's just adding to the fun. Interesting news on range. The moment we entered more of this forested area and we started to get mixed topography where there was more undulation even in the farmer's fields, the winds died down and something else began to happen. Since we dropped below 110, 70 miles an hour, my range started to improve. This is a first. We're coming off of Riding Mountain National Park. And uh, technically, I think we would call this kind of a mountain. I can see probably 100 kilometers. Down we come. You have the whole place to yourself. There's towns. In fact, they're more frequent. You're not going through these vast distances of, of no available contact with anyone, like some parts of Saskatchewan and some parts of uh, BC. But the traffic is very low. I'm not quite sure what the population of Manitoba is, but I don't think it's very high. Winnipeg, the biggest city in the province, I think is 750, 800,000 people. About every 20 minutes, a vehicle passes me. Well, maybe where I'm going. <laughs> because it's all new to me. I think it's more of a tourist area and it's October. Snows aren't that far off. That did it, coming down Riding Mountain. I'm back at a range of 401 kilometers, which is, which is exactly what I left with. I didn't know it, but from leaving Brandon and going through those fields, I was driving up the entire time. And then I went up the last part and then I came down and I was in the green making electricity. We're now leaving Riding Mountain National Park and we're back to highway speeds and we have 403 kilometers of range. We've gained another two just while I was filming. I am here at Dean Cooley Chevrolet Buick GMC in Dauphin, kindly installed a flow 50 kilowatt uh, fast charger. It's very slow. I'm only doing about 33 kilowatts. I'd be here quite a while. There's no credit card option. You have to have the flow tap card here. You can probably use the app as well. Good news is there are some hotels and motels in this area that seem to have J1772 level two chargers. So if you're staying here, there's quite a lot of options. There's another uh, 50 kilowatt flow charger at the town office. We've checked in at the Super 8. It's not the best rate, but it's got a bonus that makes the rate more than tolerable. And that is a level two charger on the back of the building but not just any level two this is a 48 amp so it's going to have my uh, vehicle tonight to 100 percent and the savings at some of these rates this makes this little spot definitely a worthy place to spend the night when i started this journey on september 18th i could film i was driving down the road at six o'clock in the morning i think it was actually 5 45 a.m and i filmed my first opener for this Canada-wide truck dump stop tour and here I am at seven o'clock in the morning 
and I've got to turn on the inside lights in the vehicle because it's too dark to film. <laughs> in my last couple provinces, it bugged me that I couldn't get up to some of these amazing communities. We've got exactly 436 kilometers of range, a slight improvement, getting closer to my 515. And the reason is I was able to plug in at level two charger and that gave us 40 kilometers of range because my batteries are all preconditioned. My vehicle's heated. This is why when you plug it at home, when you have an EV truck, it changes the world as far as your range. We are gonna go for it. We've got only two major roads that lead into the rest of Manitoba. So I'm gonna take one of them. It's a bit of a gamble, but I just wanna get up there. I don't know if anyone's driven an EV truck up to Flin Flon. We're gonna find out today. There's another challenge. I started uploading my newest video. I got it finished at nine o'clock at night in the hotel room and it is 7.30 in the morning and I'm having to leave and it's 53% loaded. So it's gonna be a real challenge getting the videos posted as I do this trip. We're heading down five west towards Saskatchewan. We're about to turn onto Highway 10 North. And I'm hoping things improve because I've been going straight up for the past 20 kilometers, just on a slow, slight incline. I'm again into some form of wind here and my range is vanishing. So I'm hoping once we make the turn, number one, a little bit more varied road, looking pretty darn flat again. We're back in flat. Sounds like an ACDC song. Back in flat, I saw my cat run all the way to Medicine Hat. I'll get copyright struck for that, just, just watch. There's our junction, 367 kilometers to the next charger. Taking this road up to the pod does not mean that there's nothing up here. I'm currently passing through the village of Asheville. I guess this town has a lot of ash. I love the name Ville. I mean, I grew up in a town called Moranville that was founded by the Morin family, I believe. You know, and they came out from Quebec or from France, I'm not quite sure. But I know that it was this French enclave in the middle of Alberta. I thought it was so cool, and everybody I went to school with was named Chelifu or Levesque. <laughs> and here we are in northern Manitoba. There's definitely a very large French presence. It's definitely part of this province's history, and you see it in the names. We have more towns up ahead, too. I believe the Swan River and Egelbert or Eggleton or Esselton, something like that. Well, I'll get back to you on that. That would be a perfect place for DC fast charger. I haven't seen any of like a Manitoba hydro fast charger. Nothing like that. It's all private. I could be wrong. Maybe there's lots of them. I went on their website. It doesn't look like they got anything. It's not completely desolate up here. There are well-sized communities. Kind of like the same situation with going up to La Range in Saskatchewan. However, there is a charger at the end of this whereas in Saskatchewan and in Alberta, there wasn't. Definitely doing better. I can take this road because there's a charger at the end of it. The question is whether it's running or not and whether I have to plug into the side of a hotel to get home. So far, the path, the, the town office and the woman there, I, mean, I think we're gonna be okay especially when they went out and physically checked for me and called me back. I'm looking forward to shaking her hand and saying, thank you for making my trip easier. You know how we're supposed to blend in? You know, when in Rome, pay attention to what the locals are doing. Don't stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, I'm in Northern Manitoba with BC plates driving an electric truck with trucked up EVs written down the side of it. That's probably not helping my case. But on top of that, then I walked into the local coffee shop after checking into my motel yesterday and I asked them for a decaf double shot oat milk latte. They looked at me like I had just ordered a pangalactic gargle blaster. And if you know what I'm referring to there, tell me in the comments below. It's Ethelbert. The community of Ethelbert is one kilometer off the highway that way. So that's our first community outside of Asheville that looked like it had about, I don't know, six or eight houses. I think Ethelbert has some services. I didn't see any sign for gas. The wind's back. And I guess the story has been, there was a major windstorm while I was doing all of this. So I was definitely not driving into typical windy conditions. These were exceptional windy conditions. And I'm driving right into the wind that's picked back up again. I've got 200 kilometers to go. I have 237 of range, but I had a 50 kilometer cushion, 100 and 
150 kilometers ago. So in 150 kilometers, I've lost almost 15 kilometers of my cushion. It's not boating well. We've been hopping around here. It's basically dog legged me around and thrown me back on Highway 10 North, which is good, kind of. Both Google Maps and Ford Navigation figured out ways of preserving my range and preserving my distance. Now, because of these winds, and I'm on a highway doing uh, highway speeds, it's getting dicey, folks. You know, you watch these out of spec reviews and different TFL reviews where they drain the EVs to zero. You know, go on and test it, see how far you can go. It's kind of fun, you know. <laughs> you know, you'll get there, they got a buddy that comes and gets them, or their friend across the street's got a flatbed. But out here, it take four hours for me to get a tow truck, maybe. Whatever way it goes, I'm gonna need a cell signal to pull anything off. And that looks like it's in and out. I've been loading a video since last night at 9 p.m. It's currently 11.25 a.m. We got 20% to go. <laughs> I haven't clarified one thing with my Trucked Up Canada tour where I'm rating province by province giving them a trucked up stamp of approval or not because it came up both in Saskatchewan and Alberta when I couldn't make certain destinations. And here's what I heard in my comment section and through a couple of the EV associations was, what do you mean you can't get to Fort McMurray? What do you mean you can't get up to LaRon? So and so friend of the president or Joe, he's got a level two charger. You can get there and then they, I think they have a level two at the country inn. Forget it. That's not part of an uh, infrastructure electric highway. That's not a gas station. That's not a diesel station. That's not a propane station. An electric station for traveling across a province, going from city to city, region to region, should not involve you sitting for five hours. It shouldn't have to be some kind of primitive method. You could always bring a bicycle along hooked up to an alternator and get yourself some exercise. And after several hours, you could drive another 10 kilometers. If I run into problems, I can probably find somebody with a NEMA 1450 plug at the convenience store, at the laundromat, somewhere. I used a level two last night in Dauphin while I stayed there and woke up with 100%. But that's because I was staying there. That's because I was checking into a hotel anyway. But they're not part of a transportation infrastructural network. If you don't agree with that and you think, well, that's being a little harsh for your trucked up rating. Well, I don't think it is. I don't think most people who own a truck would tolerate having to wait a day or half a day to get their tank filled up. We need to have an infrastructure that stands shoulder to shoulder with traditional infrastructure. If there was something in between, I'd get to where I'm going and then I'd go and do something crazier. <laughs> because that's, that's part of this whole journey is seeing how far we can push things. Right now, I haven't had to really push things so far across the entire three provinces in the fourth province that I'm in. Northern BC, without having the, the highway active and driving into the Yukon, had a couple of moments. If you haven't checked that out, that video is right here. But this is kind of our first really long stretch where there's, there's no potential for anything in between. We just passed over the 53rd parallel. Northwest Territories line is the 60th. Canada-US line, of course it changes when you get out further east because of course you've got the Great Lakes. That's the 49th parallel. So we've driven up four and we're heading for the Canadian Shield. What's a Canadian Shield? Well, it's also called the Laurentian Shield, also known as the Laurentian Plateau. Basically it's pre-Cambrian igneous and metamorphic rock. It's, it's you know, that's, that's important because it's so old. But what's really cool about the Canadian Shield is it's exposed, it's the exposed core of the North American continent. And it gets really rugged. And I believe Flint Flon sits on the Canadian Shield. We're gonna see more of that, I believe, in Ontario, but we're coming up far north to hit it here. Oh, I just got a, a warning. Nearest charger is near the edge of your range. Find a charger or risk running out of energy. So the, the warnings are coming up now for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're dropping, the wind's getting me. So there's a whole section of road work and I had to do this major detour, which I'm gonna come in around 400 kilometers for the total trip. My plan was, of course, 386 from Dauphin 
to the pass and then from there recharge and go to Flin Flon, which is like another 120. Then I gotta come back fully charged to 100% and then try to get back to Dolphin. We're gonna find out, I think, what Ford keeps in reserve. I'm actually gonna slow it down just a little bit on the highway. Another thing about Manitoba up here, there's no excuse for not putting in chargers like in BC where there's hundreds of kilometers where there's no electricity. There are power lines all the way up. Looks like it goes right up to the Northwest Territories here. And that means you can put in DC fast chargers. We are at 86 kilometers and we have 101 left. It gives us 15 kilometers now of range. Still dropping, but it's dropping to a point that we might actually roll into town without having to hit the reserves. We're gonna find out. There it goes, driving range low, uh, find charger immediately kind of stuff, yeah, all that. Yeah, sure, I'll happily find a charger. Well, things have improved a little bit. I've managed to finally pick up the fast charger location in the Ford Navigation app. I guess it's not as far away. It's in a good part of the town, I guess. It took off a few kilometers of required range to get there, which means right now I've got about 15 kilometers to spare before I'm at zero. I actually am kind of surprised, especially when having to drive that extra detour route. We're going to, we're going to be well over 400 kilometers for the trip, and I've been riding into the wind the whole way, but it's looking, well, it's looking damn rosy. I've got horseshoes up my butt. At 50 kilometers left in range, the road turned. And now we're heading northeast by east, which means that wind, it's hitting a beam of us. It's also catching my tailgate. So it's pushing me. And it seems to be getting in the bed. I can feel these buffeting things now that we're hitting the front of my truck and actually having the hood of my truck sometimes bubble from the pressure changes. <laughs> Crazy shit. So I've gained, I'm now 17 kilometers from empty. I've got a 17 kilometer cushion. I was down to 12. For this trip so far, I keep pulling off these little coups. You know, just before a town, I'm running out, pulled off the side of the road, my thermal management ran and I was screwed. What did it happen after that? It went downhill for 30 kilometers. We're in town. Civilization. At the northernmost spot in Manitoba with a charger. One in between. And this becomes a really easily accessible route. Just one. One charger somewhere between the Pass and Dauphin. And you're set. 1.7 kilometers to our charger. Now the big question is, is it operating? Oh, Thor just made that look easy. We got 21 kilometers of range left. Soon as we got into the town too, it just started racking it up because I started using my brakes, just doing one pedal driving. We're at the charger, moment of truth. The lights are flashing, doesn't say out of service. It's asking me to tap my card. Whew, let's see what happens. Sometimes you have to experience something for yourself to find out what's really going on. Well, I'm experiencing for myself, it's free. That's cool. The best news of all is I'm charging all these things written up about 20 kilowatts, 21 kilowatts. I'm charging at 44 kilowatts. So double what I was expecting. That's really good news. What an amazing thing they've done here. I'm going to go in and thank the town of the PA for putting this up and allowing uh, me to charge here in their, in their town for free. And what a godsend to actually get here with 21 kilometers of extra range. And we are off to Flin Flon. But before I do any of that, I am going to use this phone as a hotspot, plug everything in, and get that YouTube video uploaded. Now the not so good news. I mean, it's all good news. We've got 13%. We've already got 38 kilometers of range. Things are doing well to start because we're doing a fast charge at 41 kilowatts. Now that's incredibly slow, but that's great for a 50 kilowatt charger, especially one that's been rated saying it only gets around 20, 21. Here's the news that's not so good. I have to charge to 100% to get back. Not 90%, not 80%, which is typically what you do with an EV. So you're only waiting. Like we'd be here, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Instead, it's currently 2 p.m. and I have to wait here until quarter to six just to get filled up. The bad news again is that means I'm going to arrive at Flin Flon at like 9 or 10 p.m. I won't be able to get back to Dolphin until like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. 
yeah, I may need to rethink some of this, but I'm not going to because tomorrow, <laughs> I'm supposed to be having a couple of trucked up stops in Winnipeg and in uh, Portage La Prairie. And no, I'm not turning around from here. We've got to do Flin Flon because it's there and it's called Flin Flon for crying out loud. For all the petrol heads who are laughing at me right now because I have to walk around this town uh, for two and a half, three hours. Well, uh, here's the gas station just down the street from the charger. The moment I got to the pass and I and was able to just reboot everything, everything's working awesome and my video uploaded. The other good news is I think I can shave an hour and a half off my, my Flin Flon excursion. I'm up into the 300s. It's exactly 137 kilometers from here to Flin Flon. Means I don't have to wait to charge anymore. I think I can do it. I think it's, it's a little tight, but that way I could save an hour and a half. If I stick around here waiting, I'm gonna be here until 5.30. It's just after four. If I leave now, 137K there and 137K back, and I'm, you know, 275 kilometers, and I'm in the low 300s, yeah, I know, I'm doing it again. I'll leave it just a little bit longer, but I'm gonna go for it. I can get back here, charge up faster, hit the road. I might actually be able to pull it off. It's stupid. We are on our way to Flin Flon, Manitoba. We're passing through Cree Nation right now. I'm not gonna do their country a disservice by butchering their name. We are definitely uh, thick into the Northern Boreal Forest and it's cold. We're at six degrees above zero Celsius. So barely around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm thinking, maybe even, yeah, about there. And the wind is not letting up, and it just loves to track whatever I'm doing. <laughs> it's, it's my curse. I'm concerned about going back. If it keeps pivoting, I'm going to be driving into the wind all the way back south. That would not be good. This whole journey is going to be a fun one. You know, let's not go negative. Let's go positive. We're going to get back, charge it up, and just head right back. This has saved me, like at least an hour and a half. I've got 124 kilometers to go. I decided to go thank the staff for really making a difference up here. And anybody who goes on and on about how, oh, it's not a free charger because the government pays for it and we're paying for that with our tax dollars. Well, actually it was a municipal initiative. It was done locally and they're thrilled with it because it's bringing them people like me who are spending money that wouldn't spend. And they say the cost is minuscule for offering it for free. The cost of setting it up was more, but it's part of their infrastructural development plan for the community. So that whole thing about, well, we don't get gas for free. Actually, I can't express enough how the price, what the price of propane and diesel and gas would be if we just removed all those billions upon billions of dollars every year that go to the oil and gas. If they were forced to pay that bill, you'd see it at the pump. And if the incentives help do something, the oil sands up in Athabasca were a losing proposition. They lost so much money in the 70s, tons of money. And it was the Lougheed government stepped in and dumped billions into it, losing billions, like it wasn't making any money. And they did it because they looked to the future and said eventually this will make money and, and look where we're at. So that was public money, taken off your paycheck. That went to that for a decade. Trying to separate all of these things and splitting hairs is kind of dumb. It's not coming out of a big, huge coffer. It's coming from a local perspective. And a lot of times, Chamber of Commerce joins in, or you know, Lions Club, or these different associations that raise money and put that in as well. So, yeah, no. We just drove by Cranberry Portage. It's a little village on the way, 50, 45, 50 kilometers south of Flin Flon but it looks kind of cool. So we, we got to go check it out. It's got a main street. It's next, oh, it's a portage uh, that goes across two lakes. Well, that's probably why it's called portage. You got to drive down main street. I mean, you can't pass a little community like this and not pop in. There's a Cranberry Portage Heritage Museum. See, I wouldn't have seen that. Something to come back to. And there's the, the village office, which is a trailer. Post office, Cranberry Portage Post Office. Variety shop and they sell wool. Probably up here, that's a good thing to sell. Oh my goodness, I just passed something that I shouldn't have passed. Look what I found. I can sniff them out like a wolf. Coffee shop, yeah, of course I'm gonna stop. Why wouldn't I go? Yeah, okay, so it's 5.30 at night. What is that gonna do with it? 46 kilometers to go and we have made it. And then we gotta make it back. And back could be just as challenging, if not more so than going. We're starting to see these, uh, outcroppings of the rock, this igneous rock. I'm no geologist. Like I said, I'm a dumbass and knows a little bit here and there, but 
It's pretty freaking beautiful. I got out of my vehicle, turned the vehicle off to go have a coffee, and my this trip reset. So now I'm winging it. <laughs> oh, I'm such an idiot. But you don't want to leave your vehicle running. Everything, my whole life is in this freaking truck. The whole trip is in this truck. I keep forgetting though, it doesn't have a key in it. <laughs> I just hit lock. We're coming up on Baker's Narrows. It's a point between a series of lakes. It is stunning up here. There's a lot of little lodges and things up here for campgrounds. This is a place to come camping. Obviously, a lot of people in Manitoba do. There's just lakes and lakes, and, and people got their cabins and houses. I'm surprised how many people are up here. I don't know if it's just summer homes or if people live here year round, because I'll tell you, in the winter, I imagine it gets just brutal up here. I love discovery. You know, to drive your own country and realize you don't know anything about it. <laughs> I just love it. Because if I was a tourist, I'd just hang out. I'd just read everything and just be a total nerd. But I'd be doing the trucked up stop tour for three years. We've arrived in Flin Flon. Flin Flon, Manitoba. There's geese crossing signs. First thing I see. Oh my goodness, there's beaver dams everywhere. This was a mining community. Look at all the old mining equipment. Wow, yeah, that's where we are. Flin Flon's no tiny little spot. There's a lot going on here. I love the landscape. It's rugged, it's rocky, and there's a big paper mache sturgeon or something. Oh, it's, it's Captain Canuck or something. I don't know, because Captain Canuck, I don't know if it's a comic character. I can't remember now. Who the heck was Captain Canuck? It's either a comic character or some neat character, made up character, dude. Anyway, his home was Flin Flon. I don't think that was him. It looked like the Parker Brothers dude riding on a on a sturgeon or it could have been a submarine. I so much want to hang out here and learn more. And it's got this true north feel to it. I like a lot of things about Flin Flon, but here's the thing. We're burning through the electrons and Flin Flon doesn't have a charger. I got 219 kilometers and we know it's 137 back. Now I thought I had 100 kilometers of extra juice or 110. I don't. It vanished in all that wind and fighting our way here. So I'm hoping it's gonna be a smoother sail back, but we'll find out how it goes. And I'm gonna to try to get as much, you know, just capture as much of this area as I can. It's difficult to do because um, every time I look left, I go, oh, I want to shoot that, but my camera's right. And then every time I look right, I go, oh my God, I, I put the camera left. And then I want to shot straight ahead when I come into the town. And I need to cover my truck like a freaking porcupine with all kinds of stuff, because it's just me. I mean, if I had a videographer, hey, are there any videographers out there who'd like to work for the exposure? I had to stop. I just had to stop. I mean, this is like every couple of kilometers. We are back in the pass and it's 8.08 .08 p.m. We did the whole loop. That's the good news. I booked a hotel in Dauphin for tonight with the intention of getting there so I can get to Brandon in the morning, to Portage La Prairie, and then to Winnipeg so I can make my two trucked up stops, which I still intend to do. Here's the bad news. I'm gonna be sleeping right here before I get to the hotel. Why? I'm at 8.08 .08 p.m. currently. It's telling me I'll be 100% charged at 11.27 p.m. And then I have to drive 385 kilometers. If I do that at 100 kilometers an hour, I'm going to be arriving at 327 in the morning in Dauphin. That really sucks, but I'm going to do it because I'm not going to stand up anybody at my trucked up stops. I'm going to be there. I just traveled all the way to Flin Flon and back, and now I'm going to travel all the way to Dauphin thanks to the pass because their charger's free. They've made this whole trip of me discovering this area and sharing it with you and maybe creating more electric vehicle tourism in this area. I really want to thank them for what they've done here. It's going to be a freaking nail biter. I'm going to be doing it in the middle of night and I'm not going to be filming because it's going to be pitch black. Okay, I got one post here just sharing with the world. I got on the road 45 minutes early. I actually had a bit of a nap, which was great. Around 9.45, I think I fell asleep. So I got like an hour. 10.45, I was 99% charged. Now, it said it was going to be 
I turn on all my heaters and I turn on everything and I use the last little bit of the charger to warm up my cab interior and it said I got 411 kilometers of range which is phenomenal now if you recall when I conditioned my batteries um, at the hotel the night before I got 436 showing up so I knew it was going to be a little bit less but when I went and put in the destination in Ford navigation to calculate my trip it recalculated my range based upon all my driving so far and obviously road conditions and wind and everything it factored in and it said I had to find a charger that my trip was 388 kilometers which was correct and told me I could only do 337 because of the temperature because it's down to right at freezing it calculated I'd be 50 kilometers short at least well it's not gonna get any warmer so my solution was I freaking turned it off screw the stupid navigation software I'm gonna defy it what I decided to do was my phone's been off the whole time I found out a little trick that if your phone's on it starts picking up things like uh, it does the Wi-Fi projection it does the hotspot thing it does all kinds of things it does so by turning the phone off it couldn't detect the phone and it doesn't do any of those things so that was savings then I turned my pro power on board off I have nothing plugged in and then I decided well I've got a heat pump and I know it makes the vehicle more efficient but if I store all that heat inside the batteries while I'm driving in plus three it'll do better I also lowered my speed it's a hundred kilometers an hour down this highway I set it for 90 and all the truckers drop by 10 kilometers at night and the reason is there's a frick of a lot of wildlife I've seen bear I've seen moose coyote I think I saw wolf but also it dramatically improves your range EVs do better the slower you go it sounds crazy but you get better range by by driving a little slower. When I had that 411 range that it said, no, you don't anymore, you got 337 and you gotta go 388, so you're screwed. I've driven 26 kilometers and I have 385 left. This holds true. I've actually gained one kilometer since leaving. Knowing your vehicle helps. I'm getting to know Thor. I like Thor. He's not a heavy drinker. Thor's a sipper. He's a connoisseur of electrons. And I'm not gonna say anymore because I had this little light to film. I need to turn the freaking things off. And I need to turn this phone off because it's picking it up again. So I'm wasting electrons. <sighs> Dolphin Hotel, 300 and whatever kilometers away. Here we come. What an exciting evening I had. I guess morning would be a better statement. Got to Dauphine at 3.15 in the morning at the hotel. It's minus two out. Pull up to the hotel, hotel guy comes outside to greet me, and we spent the next 30 minutes trying to get the EV chargers. Now, they weren't part of the hotel, they're separate. They're on a separate network with a separate app that you have to download for these level two chargers, and it was terrible. The app wouldn't work. You couldn't even actually use the app to start the charge. It still wanted you to scan a QR code, and it said the QR code code was illegal ID entry. So it just shut the whole thing down. So this is after I'd loaded it up and it kept saying it declined my load up. It had one of these wallet things. And then I go in and find it's deducted $30. So it's gone to 10 bucks three times. And I go back in and then it shows that you have no money in your app. And I had to turn the app off and reboot my phone and then turn it back on. Then it said that I had 30 bucks, but then there was no way to start the charge in the app. So what's the point of having the app? It made me do the QR code thing again, which we already know it rejected. So it just was a complete waste of time. The hotel was awesome. They said, no problem at all. Cause I said, I'm gonna be here for three hours, three and a half hours. I'll just sleep in my truck and find somewhere else to charge. I have to. They said, done, cancel. Don't worry about it. They were all worried because it was so cold outside. And I went across the street at the GM dealership and plugged into their flow that I had plugged in the day before. It also became the most expensive slow fast charger I've ever parked at. I plugged it in, said, you're gonna be charged up by 7.45 in the morning while well, I was gonna leave at 7 a.m. So that was okay. I plugged it in to 90% by 7.45. I set my alarm clock. I got to sleep and I got myself three hours, three and a half hours of sleep in addition to the sleep that I got in the pass. And I wake up when my alarm goes off at seven o'clock. Thor is far more efficient at handshakes and working with uh, EV chargers than his predecessor Igor well in this case his efficiency didn't exactly help me because he charged up to 90% by 6 30 in the morning of course I was snoring at 7 a.m. I've got a 30 minute idle fee <laughs> 
So I could have charged up to 100% and never had to pay the idle fee. But I was too tired. I didn't even think of it. I always reset it if I'm going to sleep or do something away from the truck just in case. Well, I didn't do that. And instead of getting an extra maybe 5% between 90 and 95% and pay far less, I paid $65 to run at a DC 50 kilowatt fast charger. But anyway, I got to Dauphine. We've learned something great in this whole experience. And that is what the heat pump it can do for us. We can actually, in cold weather conditions, extend the range being calculated, extend the range. I left with 411 kilometers. When I put in my destination, Ford calculated out the temperature and said, no, you're never gonna make it. We reached a milestone with Thor last night or sometime early this morning of hitting 10,000 kilometers driven on a truck that's barely a month old. 6,000 miles and all of that's been driving into gale force winds in the face at highway speeds not using any of the wonderful regen processes or other things that can work to extend your range or make your vehicle efficient i drove in the most inefficient way into a, a wall of wind so that's why it's 411 but the cold brought it down to 335 so i turned the heat in the cabin off i ran the seat heaters and i ran the steering wheel heater you're not just turning off like a resistive heater like in in igor it drew current like a baseboard heater what your heat pump is doing is it's managing heat in a much more efficient way so you don't get the losses but if you turn off the cabin heat it can now utilize that heat to improve the vehicle's range the management of heat transfer between all the different systems and sure enough it worked it worked really well i got to dauphine pulled in so remember, I left with 411 and I arrived with 438. I didn't gain back range, like from a range loss and gaining it back from doing this with the heat pump. I increased my range by 28 kilometers. And I did it when it was two degrees below freezing. Overnight, driving for four hours. If that would have been my XLT, I would have lost a shit pile of range. So Ford was correct in calculating out that 335 number from 411. This opportunity exists for all of you who have a Lightning with a heat pump or another type of EV with a heat pump. If it's, I don't know if it's as good as Ford's. Now, if you got four people in your cab, you're driving on holidays and it's freezing cold outside and you turn the heater up, you, your family's not gonna like you very much. And you're also gonna ice up from all the condensate from your breath, it's gonna freeze to the windshield. But it didn't for me, there's one or two people inside here and you're using your ambient body temperature and you've got the seat heaters on and your steer steering wheel heat, you're good. I didn't fog up at all and it was minus two. But I got cold. I had a jacket across my lap to keep my legs warm. I wore my big jacket and it was chilly. There is a little tool in our kit that we can put to use. I'm closing in on 10% improvement in my range in really cold conditions. That's freaking cool. So it was all worth it. And now it's eight o'clock in the morning and there's a pretty good chance that I'm gonna to get to my Portage La Prairie meeting on time for my first truck dump stop. We are at the Tesla supercharger here in Portage La Prairie. There are a lot of superchargers and, and slowish DC fast chargers, but there's no problem uh, so far anywhere in Manitoba where there's a large population. I'm taking a look at all the population centers of Manitoba and I'm looking at where you know 90% of all people live and how easy it is to get to every one of those places and have intermediary charges to do so. But if you're heading up past Lake Winnipeg, you've got Lake Manitoba. If you're going up into that area, how far can you go before you get yourself into trouble? We're gonna find out. Between Portage La Prairie and Winnipeg, we're back to flat. <laughs> I mean, I mean flat. We are here in front of the Daily Grind in windy and sunny Winnipeg, Manitoba. This place is hopping inside. There's like no tables. We had to line up on the little uh, window stalls. We finally got a table with some chairs, but they limit your stay because they're so busy <laughs> by on how much you order. Um, I don't blame them though. Food is excellent, soup is fantastic, sandwiches were great, coffee's excellent, got great smoothies, love my stay here. It's on now to find a place 
to get some more videos to all my truck tough folks and we're gonna go on one more little adventure before we hit the road for Ontario so we got a little bit more work to do here in in Manitoba before we can make a trucked up decision. I have checked into the Super 8 East here in Winnipeg and I am absolutely amazed by this place. Not only is it exceptional value for the price, actually the best I found in Manitoba so far, is they also have a 40 amp level two charger complimentary for anyone coming through. Now that is thinking ahead. What's really nice is they've completely renovated the entire hotel based upon the price and all of the places that I've stayed so far across Canada. When I walked into my room, I was completely blown away with what I was getting for value. The best news is, soon as they found out that I was trying to promote and support EV travel across this country, they have graciously sponsored my Manitoba video. I am so grateful. And the good news is if you click the links below, there's a rewards program. And also they have other locations in Manitoba and in Alberta. Those are also listed in the description below. So take advantage of that and you'll be able to save even more. Again, my sincere thanks to Super 8 East here in Winnipeg for sponsoring this video. It is an insanely windy and uh, stormy morning here in Winnipeg. And there's storm clouds for their EV charging network here in the city as well. I'm rather surprised, especially after being in Western Manitoba, Southwestern Manitoba and going all the way to Flin Flon and back. Portage La Prairie was fantastic. Uh, Brandon, Manitoba was fantastic. It's so strange to get to the city with 775,000 people in it and seeing that that starts to fall apart. There's not a lot of chargers. There's enough I can get by, but it's limited. And the number of DC fast chargers over 150 kilowatt are few and far between. There's a lot of 50 kilowatt, but for a city of this size, limited, and a lot of them are down for repair. This is the largest percentage I've seen so far traveling across Canada in a major urban area where so many EV chargers are down. It doesn't mean you can't get around. However, if you're coming through Winnipeg, like I discovered, there's some great hotels here that have level twos. Those are your saving grace, because then you charge for free and you wake up with your vehicle charged right up to the top overnight. And that's what I'm getting from Super 8 East, which has been a godsend here, because I don't have to worry about it. I'm, I'm awake here in the morning with 440 kilometers of range, and I didn't even have to plug in last night because I did such a small amount of driving in town. And of course, now that I'm in a city and it's very congested that I'm regenning so much, I'm barely moving the needle. When all said and done, it's not horrible, but it's kind of tragic. And the other tragedy is for the first time, and although this doesn't have to do with charging in infrastructure, it's also about the attitude towards EVs. Winnipeg has to be the worst I've experienced so far. It was quite a, uh, a shock. You know, especially when you deal with a hotel and they're so courteous and welcoming and progressive. And then when you drive around the city, I haven't been screamed at, coal rolled, threatened uh, as much as I have been here in Winnipeg. I mean, when I was in Alberta, where a lot of people call it redneck country or oil country, people were civil, courteous and asked a lot of questions. You know, they were open to debate. Many of them didn't agree with electric vehicles, but they were like, well, you want one, go ahead. You know, like it wasn't angry. I actually feel for the first time in my trip, somewhat threatened driving around Winnipeg. But we're not done yet. We're gonna go from here to Ontario and we're gonna kick that off tomorrow. And that's gonna really wrap it up for uh, Manitoba. We only have one major paved road north that I haven't done in the area, but that is a critical area. If you want to get up to Lake Winnipeg, if you want to get up in that whole region of Winnipeg where there is a significant population number, you're not doing it because there's several chargers there. I think three out of four that I looked at to do that route for you were down. That's not a good batting average. And all of them we're 50 kilowatt. You've got some areas east of Flin Flon where you can take highways through 
to other parts of eastern Manitoba. There's no chargers there at all. The southern end is great. The vast majority of the population, of course, just like Saskatchewan, lives in that region. But even then, unlike Saskatchewan, that has a lot of central infrastructure in those areas, Winnipeg's a fail so far. Uh, and that means getting to other parts of Manitoba from Winnipeg are potentially failing. We're gonna take a deeper look as we head east. I just went east of Winnipeg to check out this storm system that we've got rolling into the city. And now I'm heading back into one of the worst winds I've encountered so far on this trip. I've turned my noise cancellation mic on because I could barely hear myself inside the cab. This wind is buffeting the truck around and I'm telling you, if I put a couple little fins on the side of this baby, I'd be airborne. I was going to head downtown Winnipeg, get some nice shots, but it's a freaking monsoon. It's raining, the winds are nuts. But I also attached the GoPro, went driving toward downtown, and about 80 kilometers an hour, 50, 55 miles an hour, whew, off goes my GoPro with the suction cup on this gust, this insane gust that almost lifted my truck up. And when it hit, it just took the GoPro off into the ditch. I think it landed on some soft ground. I tested it. It's fine. I can't believe it's fine. I thought, oh, there goes my B-roll. There goes, you know, how am I going to get a GoPro on the road? You know, you're going to order the damn things online. Anyway, it would have been a problem, but I got saved. I got saved by some really good fortune. I got a horseshoe the size of Cleveland up my butt, but I am not hooking the GoPro on and I am not going downtown because I've heard it's absolute insanity down there and they're advising, you know, don't head into town if you don't have to because it'll suck the hair off your head. And I don't have a lot of hair left, so screw that idea. So what's the verdict on Manitoba? When I first arrived, I was really impressed. My first experience was Brandon. Everything about the place just screamed embracing of the electric highway. And then, I went from there to Flin Flon, Manitoba. And although it was dicey, I got there and back. That was a lot further than I could have gone in Saskatchewan. On top of that, with the installation of just one 50 kilowatt fast charger, you could make it to Thompson, which is way the heckin' gone. Just one. So there's enough there that there's hope to build up the north and get out to all of those areas. Manitoba was looking good and then when I came back I went to Portage La Prairie and that looked good I thought okay you can get to a large part of Manitoba and get back and then I entered Winnipeg this is the epicenter of the population of the entire province and it's abysmal how many chargers are in that city compared to the population and it gets worse if you're heading up to Lake Winnipeg if you're going on any vacation if you're wanting to do anything north of Winnipeg there was one DC fast charger that was available to me near Lake Winnipeg and it was broken so I couldn't take that journey and then I thought well I can branch out maybe there's some ways that I can get up and around to do that no there was one and again the write-ups were kind of scary on PlugShare about how well it was operating so suddenly it went from being you know the place to uh to, to visit like that it was keeping pace with other provinces and then where it mattered most it did not hold up manitoba is not getting the trucked up stamp of approval for those reasons it's got a ways to go and with that i'm going to bid adieu to this province i wish them well change is coming one way or the other but currently if you're coming through this area visit flint flan Get up to the Pa, enjoy some of the most beautiful scenery in the Canadian Shield. Head back to the highway and you won't have a problem at all. Outside of that, if you find this content valuable, if you believe these videos are important that what I'm doing with this channel is worthwhile, please click the like, subscribe and bell notification icon. It, it does, it, it actually keeps me going and any support you can offer it keeps me going. I'm a one pony operation here. I'm chief editor and bottle washer, and it takes a lot of resources to pull this off. So for all the support that you give me, again, as always, 
Thanks for watching.